evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Fields. My guest tonight, Adolphus Bush V. You may recognize the name from a different industry, but he's not here to talk about that. He's here to talk about cannabis today. Adolphus, thank you so much for being on The Fields today, man. Welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. You are very welcome, man. When did you realize that cannabis was going to be your path and not brewing? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, so I went to school in Colorado. I went to Colorado State University. Um, I was a cannabis consumer and passionate about cannabis before I went to school in Colorado. But I think that is what really um, kind of ingrained the passion of cannabis into me. Um, and, you know, I, I got to experience the medical market out in Colorado for four years while I was going to school out there, um, which really got me excited about working in the industry. I also applied for a job at Anheuser-Busch when I was probably a junior in college to do a summer internship and then hope, hoped that that would lead into a full-time position with them. Unfortunately, they reached back out to me and said that they had implemented a nepotism law so I could no longer work for the company because it's, the family sold the company in 2008 and they were no longer hiring any Bush family members. So that was um, unfortunate at the time, but probably very fortunate to have to have had that happen to me just because that drove me to get into the cannabis space and here I am. How did your family react when you said can't do brewing, not going to start my own brand, I'm going for cannabis? You know, they were supporters. Uh, my immediate family, my dad, my mom, they were very much uh, supporters. I think in the beginning it was um, a change for them. I think it was a change for everyone once cannabis started to become legal in different states and my dad was a full supporter from day one. My mom, it took her a little bit of time to kind of understand the industry and understand the product. But overall, I think um, she understood it. She supported me. And here we are. I mean, now they're full supporters. Well, right now, you have two brands under your umbrella. You have Teal and you have High Five. The concentrates and pre-rolls are Teal and edibles are high five. What led to the decision to focus on those two categories exclusively? Um, you know, my experience out in Colorado, I had a lot of experience with um, flour and, and concentrates, vape pens, and, you know, uh, solid concentrates like live batter, butter, um, cured batter, cured butter, cured sugar. Um, and then also, you know, quite a bit of time spent at Keef Cola. I worked for Keef Cola for three years. Um, and we made all kinds of edibles back in the day. Obviously, the the number one being our um, infused sodas. But I was in that space for a long time. And it really, I guess, ingrained a, a passion for edibles into me as well. And High Five was a brand that we wanted to launch for a long time. And we've you know succeeded in launching the gummies under the High Five brand. We've got a lot of new products rolling out under High Five soon. And... That's Can you tease what some of those are? <laughs> Is there anything savory in that drop? Not, well, depends on how you look. So not savory quite yet. We are doing a flavorless powder. So like a drink additive powder. So fully water soluble drink additive powder. Um, that'll be both flavorless and flavored in the future. Um, and then we are going to be launching a line of flavored vape pens to go along with the flavors of the gummies that, we, that we're offering. Um, we're also r and d some full-spectrum gummies right now for the High Five brand. Now, choosing the right flavors for your products are vitally important no matter what it is that you're making. What are those R&D sessions like? How do you decide on new flavors to choose? Yeah, good question. Um, we, have, we have a flavoring company that we work with over in Illinois. They're fantastic. They're a very well-known flavoring company. So we, we do a lot of due diligence with them. Um, just to see what's trending in the market and what flavors have been have been really moving well in you know several different markets and several different product types so that's how we initially kind of pinpoint some flavors and then we actually you know get flavor samples from them and create a lot of non-medicated batches of gummies and then we try them as a team in-house of course again non-medicated so that we can try them in the facility and make a quick decision on the flavors that we want to launch and that's that's the R&D process, working with our flavoring company, doing a ton of R&D, some half batches in our facility of non-medicated. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we we all sit down, everyone in the facility. You know, we have a rather small facility right now. There's probably 14 or 15 full-time employees that are there every single day. 
So everyone gets together in the in the conference room, tries some gummies and and picks, you know, the flavors that they that they like the most. So what kind of research did you do when choosing the name of your company and the color teal? So, you know, it, we wanted to pick something that we were really passionate about here in Missouri. Um, and when I say we, I mean me and then my other four founding partners, um, none of which are people that I, I knew for a long period of time before coming back to Missouri. They were actually um, a family friend that worked in the horticulture space and works at a or owns a very large greenhouse operation out in, out in Illinois for seasonal flowers. So he had that horticulture background. And then a couple of his family members and friends joined our team to apply for licenses as well. Um, when we were picking names, we you know each created a list of names that we had either been thinking about for the cannabis space for a couple of years or picked different things that meant a lot to us as individuals. Um, we're 100% Missouri owned. So things that kind of stood out in Missouri and that meant a lot to us in that area. Um, and teal kind of rolled right off the tongue. One, it rhymes with heel. Um, teal is a color of medical scrub, so it fits the medical industry very well. But really what teal is named after is uh, the green wing duck teal. So uh, the, the species of duck. Um, there's many different species of ducks. There's green wing teal, there's blue wing teal, there's cinnamon teal. Um, teal are very small compared to most ducks. They're fast flying, they're very agile ducks. Um, and we preserve their land and their habitat in the area that we operate in. So we own, my father owns and has been in our family for a very long time, about 2,000 acres right down in that area where we have our facility. 99.5% of that land all falls in the floodplains. And we could not, of course, build on that land. We also have a conservation easement that we placed on all of that land so that no one can build down in that area. Because again, it's in the floodplain and that's the last thing you want. So we preserve that land for all of the animals down there, um, you know, from September through February or March every year. We have a very large population of ducks because we're right in the Midwest Flyway. They're, they're migrating through and teal is very dear to me and my family and their land and their habitat. And again, we operate a very small, very efficient, very low footprint facility in that area out of the floodplain on a piece of land that we own and that's been in the family for years and years. Um, and, and really that's how we chose a name. Um, it it kind of fit the company perfect. We have a environment friendly approach to all of our operations and our packaging. We're trying to eliminate all of the plastic, trying to go in more of the recycling route. Um, the ability to recycle all of our, all of our packaging um, is very important to us. And then just, you know, having a, a small, um, footprint when it comes to, you know, creating any sort of pollution and trying to just operate as environmentally friendly as possible. So that that name really fit well uh, for High Five. High Five was a name that I was kicking around for years. I know there's one or two other High Fives in the cannabis space in different states right now, mainly dispensary names. There was no... Um, did you have to reach out to them and say, hey, I want to call my business High Five. Is that cool? You know, we did a, a really deep search on High Five. And from what we found, nothing was pushing the boundaries too much to where we needed to reach out, which was great. You know, there's a there's a High Five dispensary, but it's H-I and the number five up in like Vancouver, Washington. Um, and there may have been one other company, but it wasn't the same spelling. They weren't focusing on the same types of products. And high five, obviously high being the psychoactive effect you get from THC, fits the industry well. Um, five kind of calls out the fifth generation of the Anheuser-Busch family. Again, our company is not affiliated or associated with Anheuser-Busch whatsoever. Um, we don't have anyone from the Bush family as part of our company, except for me and one of my cousins who invested like any other investor would. Uh, presented to him just like I would any other investor. And then my mother, who I did the exact same thing for, you know, presented to her as well. They decided to invest into Teal. Um, but other than that, you know, again, not affiliated with with Anheuser-Busch at all. High five, the, the number five um, spelled out kind of calls out the fifth generation of the Bush family and creating a new legacy in a different industry. When Teal came out with their cartridges, um, I know you guys were using botanical terpenes in there. Was that a business decision? Were cannabis terpenes too expensive? Or was there something the botanicals brought to the equation that cannabis couldn't? 
No. So we, we have this discussion a lot and you know, what we want to do is provide, be transparent to the consumer, be transparent to our dispensary partners and provide a consistent experience, you know, time and time again for everyone. So getting into a new market like Missouri, when we don't have our own cultivation to isolate cannabis terpenes, not knowing the exact quality of the material on the market yet, because it's such a new, you know, market here in Missouri, we wanted to make sure that we could provide a consistent experience for the consumer. One way that we knew to do that was taking all natural botanically derived terpenes um, and infusing them into our, you know, full or broad spectrum distillate that we create in house at Teal. Um, as you know, you know, a, a limonene derived from a lemon is the same thing molecularly as a limonene derived from a super lemon haze plant, cannabis plant, if it's in its pure form. So we are just to let you know, and all of everyone watching this know that we are eliminating eventually that distillate line under teal. That was always the plan. Um, that was a good starting point for us to get a, a good product out to market for the patients that needed a product. And our goal was to get product to market as quickly as we possibly could. Uh, we'll be replacing that line with a full spectrum line. So the full spectrum line of cartridges, just like the flower you smoke in a bowl, it'll be oil derived from dried cured cannabis flower never trim, never shake, always flower. Um, and that'll be our full spectrum cart. Um, the cart, the cart that's sitting right here and one of our, you know, our live resin line of cartridges, we use, you know, the top quality fresh frozen material in the market here in Missouri to create our live resin products. Do you see a need in the industry to shift away from the whole indica sativa hybrid paradigm to more a cannabinoid terpene profile? I do. I do. I, I, you know, that is one thing again, that we always talk about quite a bit. Um, and you and I have had this conversation. We've, we've had conversations with all of our accounts about this, all of the dispensaries that we work with, all of the different, you know, um, employees in the cannabis industry that we're working with. And we get as far down as talking to the patients about this as well. One thing that we've discovered over the years being in the industry, or at least that, that I've noticed is a lot of people still shop that way still shop coming in and say, hey, I would like a sativa or I would like an indica or I would like a hybrid. I think a lot of those people don't necessarily want to have to do the research to look into the different cannabinoids and decide, you know, how they are going to react with their endocannabinoid system and whether it's going to be something that they can consume during the day that's not going to make them tired, you know, something that they can consume at night to help them sleep, uh, whatever they're looking for. You know, there's some people out there that would rather go in and just be able to say, hey, I'm buying a sativa today, or hey, I'm going to buy an indica today because that's what I like to consume. Um, so I think right now it's a smart business decision to include that, you know, category or whatever you want to call it, you know, include indica sativa hybrid on your packaging one way or another, just so you can lead them in, in the direction of saying, hey, this typically would provide sativa effects for most consumers. But we don't like that. I don't think anyone who's been in the industry and has the knowledge that we do um, like to explain things that way. We we would rather say, hey, you know, scan the QR code on the back of the packaging. Read the COA. Look at the, read the COA, look at the terpene pr profile, try the product, and then let us know how you feel, how it makes you feel. Does it make you tired? Does it make you you know, really energetic? Does it make you focus? Whatever it might, whatever it might be. And then figure out what terpenes work best with your endocannabinoid system, just with your body um, and, and what certain terpenes do for use. Because again, certain people act differently or react differently to the different cannabinoids and different terpenes. So again, to kind of sum it all up right now, I think that it's wise to have it on your packaging just because then you, if you do have a consumer coming in who strictly wants to buy off of Indica Sativa Hybrid, um, they have that option. But as we try to, again, I think that's a good idea right now as we try to educate people more. But once that education is more um, widely known, then I think there's going to be a time where that is taken off of all packaging. And the terpene profiles and the cannabinoid profiles are, mo are more prominent on the packaging. 
and hopefully too there will be more consistency in the way the information is presented on the labels yep. reminiscent of the food industry all those labels look the exact same way so when you see you know exactly where to look for the information you need exactly that's a great point so when you're shopping in a dispensary how can you tell if the product is high quality you can't exactly see through the jar yep exactly um you know we love talking about this as well, because what we do in our lab, you know, especially after a year of operating, we feel like is really special. And we have amazing processes that create very, very high quality concentrates or extracts. Um, what extraction method do you use? So we do a hydrocarbon extraction method. So okay. we use ETS extraction equipment and um, a lot of post-processing equipment, some stuff that we're upgrading right now, actually, just to have more capabilities downstream in the post-processing step. Um, we are, you know, fully cold in terms of our extraction method. We are extracting at, um, at cryo temperatures. Um, so we are extracting very, at very cold temperatures. Um, I would say that when you go into a dispensary, typically you should be looking obviously for you should you should really purchase with your nose you know a lot of people say purchase with your nose to really understand the terpene profile make sure those you know compounds of the cannabis plant are still retained in the in the end product um color is a big deciding factor for a lot of people out there um unfortunately unfortunately it's a deciding factor um you know we Never. Why, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. why, why is color uh, a bad thing? Because I know there's color remediation out there yep. where they strip all color away from the product. Yep. Do you not want color in the product, a, a uniform looking product? No. So what I mean is, you know, on both ends of the spectrum, I would say that typically when someone sees a white extract, they think it's been very heavily CRC'd. Mm -hmm. And that may, very well might be the case. Um, and typically we don't like to see anything very heavily CRC'd or CRC at all, um, because that is stripping out a lot of the desirable compounds. Uh, with that said, you're also stripping out all of the, you know, chlorophylls, all the lipids, all the fats. So that actually makes it a little bit smoother of a smoke, mm -hmm. because when you strip out those impurities, you're going to get a less harsh inhalation when you're when you're consuming those products. On the other end of that, you know, if if it's a darker color, you still have a lot of those fats, a lot of those lipids, a lot of those chlorophylls. So you may have a little bit harsher of a smoke because that is still in the product. But the flavor's in the fat. But that's correct. If I may use Flavor a food analogy. Yep, exactly. You know, so depending on how you strip those things from, if you do, if you do any sort of remediation, there are, of course, ways to retain, you know, your desirable compounds like, like your terpenes, of course, and your flavonoids. Um, for us, we don't ever use any filtration step on any live products. Um, in, in regards to cured extracts and cured full spectrum cartridges and stuff like that, we start out by using a very cold extraction method. And typically we will never do any sort of filtration to take any color out. When it's a cured extract, when it's starting from dry material, sometimes there is a little bit of filtration that's needed so that it's not a very, very dark brown color. Even if it's very, very high quality material that you're starting with, sometimes when you're, you're, when you're using cured material, it just comes out too dark to where the consumer will not, pay, will not purchase an extract that's that dark in color. It could be still a phenomenal product. So that's, that's the balance. One thing that people, there's a huge negative connotation against CRC or toward CRC. Um, I get it. But what people need to realize is as long as it's not abused and it's used in the right way, you're actually only pulling the impurities from the cannabis product. Mm -hmm. um, all of the water we drink out of water bottles, it's all CRC'd. There's filtration steps, same CRC media that our water goes through to filter out all of the impurities from our water. Um, and, you know, probably a good handful of the other products that people are consuming on a regular basis. Um, again, we hardly ever use it. And we certainly, um, if, if we ever do any sort of filtration steps, we make sure that they're being done the right way and that all of the desirable compounds are being left in the final product. 
What's your favorite kind of concentrate out of all of them? Butter, batter, shatter, wax. What's your favorite? Oh, man. Um, really depends on the terpene profile for me, but I would say that, you know, a live batter or a live sugar would probably be my two favorite types of extracts right now. I do love rosin. I love solventless. Um, I'm a very, you know, I'm a very active individual. I like to, I like to think that, you know, consuming a solventless product, um, is what I would typically gravitate towards if I was buying, you know, the, them sitting right next to each other, which one would I gravitate towards? Mm -hmm. With that being said, you know, with hydrocarbon extraction and with live extracts, you'll never get to the same terpene percentages and to the same terpene profiles with solventless that you will with hydrocarbon extraction. Um, it's, it's, there's been plenty of studies on it. There's been plenty of side-by-side -side comparisons and what you can do with hydrocarbon and the certain post-processing steps is pretty phenomenal. Um, with that said, I do love rosin. We are going to be getting into solventless extraction and rosin pretty soon as nice. well, which we're excited about. Um, but, but yeah, right now I would have to say out of our concentrates, our live batters, our live butters and our live sugars. We need more hash on the market. I'll definitely say oh, yeah. that I'm, I'm old school. I, I love some good old hash, yep. but you guys teal are in the melee on the Mississippi, the hash battle slash rap battle that's going on, which leads me to this question. Are concentrates truly hash? Because when I think hash, I think, you know, charas or at yeah. least finger hash from yeah. breaking up buds. What's your opinion? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, if you're breaking, it's, it all comes down to science. I don't want to get into too much of that debate right now, only because I know there's going to be some people, you know, there's some people watching this that, that might think differently than I do. Um, I typically, you know, would call hydrocarbon extract extract and rosin hash okay um because for me at least just from what you're extracting from the plant ultimately is the same thing um the difference would be with um you know with rosin you're still you have more plant material in the final product than you do in a hy hydrocarbon extract um just because you're you're able to further refine with hydrocarbon when you're running the process than you are with, you know, rosin or, or solventless. Um, but I'll leave it at that for now. I mean, I, okay. I, I typically put you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, I, I typically call hash, you know, I, I refer to, I really refer to all of it as extract. Uh, but, but I would say that I call hash, you know, I refer to both hydrocarbon extract and rosin as hash. Okay. Yep. What kind of, um, what kind of tools do you use to consume dabbing concentrates yeah. with and like low price point, high price point. Yep. You know, one thing that I've kind of gravitated away from over the past couple of years is just using a torch. Um, just my living situation and the setting that I've been in over the past, I don't know, five years or so has made me gravitate away from using, you know, your typical rig and a torch and gravitating towards using a Puffco. Puffco makes it very easy um, to consume kind of really wherever you need to consume if you're consuming extracts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I prefer a Puffco right now, to be completely honest, that would be on the higher end, I guess, for me in okay. terms of price point in a pinch on in a pinch, you know, I'm pretty old school. Like I, I actually have still some of those, um, Cooley vape pens. If you've heard of the brand Cooley, it was started by a guy who, who lives here, uh, friends of my sister, they went to high school together. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, basically like a dab pen. It has coils. You pull off the top, you put a little concentrate on, you put the top back on, and then you press the press a button just like you would on this vape pen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Would you like to press the button on your vape pen? Take, yeah. a, take a hit? You've been staring at it this whole time. That I have, yes. It's been staring back. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever see concentrates overtaking flour as the number one product in the market? Oh, man. Question. At the at the rate it's going, it's going to be a long time. I think for me, at least, I'm still old school in the way I like to consume. And I still prefer, you know, a joint or some really, really high quality flour to consume just because that's that's just the traditional method of consumption for me. Um, so 
it's a hard it's a hard question to answer because the way it's trending right now probably not just because concentrates still make up a very small but if we're talking are we including vape pens yeah okay so i think at some point yes i think if we're including vape pens and solid extracts that you have to you know consume either via dabbing or putting on top of your bowl or however else you might consume a solid extract um those two categories combined i would say may take over flour here in you know I can't give you a number of years, but 40, 50 years from now. Is it just building a groundswell saying this is a more healthy choice for you as opposed to combusting plant material? To a certain extent, yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's also some studies that need to be done on on the percentages of THC in a lot of these extracts and consuming those on a, on a regular basis, you know, throughout the entire day. I would say that if we're talking about consuming flour that way versus extracts that way, you might say the opposite, that consuming flour is actually a little bit healthier for your overall health, whether that's your brain health or your body health or just everything. Um, I would say that there's a debate there to be had in terms of just health, you know, mm-hmm. health. Um, I would say if we're getting down to the nitty gritty, obviously rosin being a solventless is definitely one of the healthier ways to consume. Um, with that said, you know, all of our methods in our facility for hydrocarbon extraction most of all of our COAs are coming back, you know, at, at very close to non-detect or, or non-detect for everything across the board. And we're working in that direction to make sure that all of our COAs are coming back at non-detect every single time. Are we there yet on everything? No. Are we well below the threshold of, you know, the limits for certain things? Yes, well below. Uh, but I would say we're working to, to make sure that all of our hydrocarbon extracts are at non-detect every single time. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of The Feels. Got to do my thank yous, though. Thanks to Utopia Experience. You know, I got to say this place is starting to feel like a warm sweater for me. It's very comfortable, and I feel very safe here. So thank you very much, Utopia. And thank you to my sponsor this week, Max's Meats. I got to be honest, when I walked into that place for the first time, I had never seen so much meat in my life. It is unbelievable. If you've been paying attention to the crawl at the bottom of the screen too, you're going to notice a small selection of the different choice cuts of meat that they have. They're right down the street from us, right down the street, right down the sidewalk from us at Field State. Go down there, check them out. Thank you to this week's clothing sponsor, I can't see very much you can't see very much on there but i will tell you it does say every opportunity is an opportunity and if you let an opportunity pass you by then you have lost that opportunity so when you see an opportunity recognize thank you to the guys at i for this fantastic sweatshirt and thank you to my guest today adolphus bush the fifth he said it before we've met at a couple of industry events before we've met at pop-ups before i have always enjoyed our conversations Today is no exception. Adolphus, thank you so much for being on The Fields. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you out there for watching. We'll see you next time.